Hello, everyone, and welcome to my panel. Of course, given the nature of the format, it is a bit more of a presentation. But I'm here for the same reason that the genre of horror is a permanent fixture in all artistic mediums. There is a certain craving, a morbid desire in people looking to experience the terrifying, tragic, and horrific nature of dark stories. Right Hive is no different, so here we are. It is my sincerest hope that you enjoy what I've prepared for you. An excursion into the literary, philosophical, and psychological inner workings behind one of the most important emotions to the human condition, fear. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and welcome to Storytelling Through the Eyes of an Undertaker. I suppose it would be prudent to do a bit more of an in-depth introduction to myself, especially since the topics we're about to delve into are a bit involved, and you might find yourself scratching your head wondering how I got to these conclusions. So if you aren't familiar with me, I am the sole writer, host, and producer for a podcast called Mania. Mania is an ongoing celebration of monsters, villainy, and the fascinating recesses of the human psyche. Sometimes I even call it old world true crime because it focuses on grisly events and individuals before the 21st century. Yet the key to the show aren't just the stories, it's um, the voices. You see, instead of just covering criminals such as Jack the Ripper or H.H. H. Holmes or thieves in Victorian London, I like to tell their stories from, from their perspective. That's why the slogan of the show is the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. It is my sincerest belief that by, by looking through some of the most horrible eyes, we can paradoxically see the world much brighter, or at the very least, find ourselves much stronger in the face of our own terrors. I started this project about a year and a half ago, though I had been writing for many years before that. Um, but several months ago, I started to get the keen sense that Despite my best attempts to fully capture the common themes and imagery of horror, um, that, my vo that my own voice lacked uh, the substance for it. So instead of looking for it in more history books, I decided to actually go out and get my hands dirty. And that's when I made the decision to change my day job. Of course, many writers have jobs to support themselves, and I am no exception. <laughs> Um, so nowadays, when I am not working on the show, I work for a mortuary. My job as an undertaker primarily deals in the organization, transportation, and processing of human bodies. It can be as, as visceral as tending to a suicide in, in somebody's own home, uh, finding a body that has been decomposed for several weeks, or can be as attached as the simple relocation of an expected death from a hospital morgue to another location. And though death is not a crucial feature to every horror story, for me, mortality is the penultimate fear. One way or another, it seems to be at the heart of most horror stories. Lurking behind all those layers of plots, characters, and monsters is the, is the plain fear of life ending, or perhaps even just of life's suffering. So I thought that by getting close to it, perhaps as close as I could possibly get without doing it myself, I could explore those dark places of the mind with a bit more authority. And I'm both satisfied and, as you might imagine, somewhat mortified that the experiences I've had gave me exactly the substance I've been looking to impart in my stories. So I suppose the real question uh, you might be having is, is, is why do it? Why, why, why choose to tell dark stories? Why go down this path? Why chase after ghosts when life often feels so haunted already. And that brings us to mental illness and the macabre. The third crucial piece for this is mental illness. Right before the time that mania was brought into the world was when I was just starting to, for the first time in my life, really get a handle on my bipolar 2 disorder. 
Ever since I began experiencing the symptoms of the disorder, I was fighting it, tearing at myself, straining so hard to find happiness, to want to run away from the depressive tendencies, in essence to be at a war with the, the darker parts of my being. But it was like struggling in quicksand. The more I resisted, the deeper I sank. And then something clicked. And that click was the passion for the macabre. Just two years ago, I was the kind of person who, when they watched horror movies, would turn the sound on the laptop as low as possible, or, or just completely off. I would dim the screen and, and push the computer to the far end of the bed so as to be away from the jump scares, to disentangle myself as much as I could from the rising tension. Those agonizing moments when one is about to come face to face with that creature that has been teased at in the corners behind door frames and at the edges of you. Embracing horror movies and stories was um, a direct journey to embracing the darker sides of my psyche. I decided that if this mental illness would perhaps be with me until the bitter end, that I really only had one course of action, to learn how to coexist with it. But I, I was afraid. I was deeply afraid. I was so um, afraid of living with it for the rest of my life that I had to come close to ending it. Um, somehow, some way, I, I started to find comfort in those movies and stories that I used to push away. It arose out of a kind of passion that, just like any any passion or calling, sort of sort of picks you. Um, but I even started to see those stories as beautiful. Those writers and directors, I realized, were doing what I needed to do. They were dissecting those things that terrify us. Not just out of curiosity or entertainment, but to get right up against that which plagues us all one way or another. Fear. It was everything, and it continues to be everything for me. The careful collection of setting the careful selection of setting, rather, the, the history behind hauntings, cult rituals, black magic, or psychopathic tendencies, the way the soundtracks build and crescendo in these riveting swells, like the pumping of a heartbeat at the peak of adrenaline. Those stories even felt similar to the more forgiving melancholy found in dark romanticism. And then there were the antagonists, the monsters. I began to see them in a different light, too. The antagonists are only doing what they are meant to do. It was around this time that my interest in horror was won over utterly and completely and turned into a passion with the help of the director Ari Aster. Uh, you'll know him for some films like The Witch, uh, Midsummer, and Hereditary, as well as some work he did, I believe, um, with The Lighthouse. Um, in any case, Black Philip, the goat in The Witch, is merely a manifestation of Lucifer and playing off the paranoia, tumult, and strain of a Puritan family in the colonial era. In Hereditary, we meet a cult driven by their devotion for one of Hell's princes, Payman. And in Midsummer, we discover how blind and ruthless faith and tradition can be. But in none of these films is the antagonist entirely separate from the characters which invite them in and ultimately allow them to take control. In essence, it isn't the antagonist's fault that they wreak havoc. They were designed that way. They're, they're meant to act that way. It was the characters that facilitated it. That was when I started to see a pattern, metaphor. I started to wonder, aren't the unending tragedies and challenges of life mirroring that behavior. And just like anyone else, I, I had my own demons. For years, I had been failing to coexist with the depressive side of, of bipolar 2. And despite my fighting, I was somehow giving it just more and more power. The only real way, in my opinion, to fully enjoy a horror movie is to find some means to, to root or to be on the side of the antagonist. It just makes it more fun. That's how you get through the fear and find a sort of masochistic enjoyment in the rising tension. 
When the jump scares and the full reveal reveals happen, it's not just shock, but it's a kind of awe, uh, appreciation, and celebration of the raw power those creatures or villains represent. Watching the interplay between the characters and how they respond is, is just fascinating. I define horror as the observation of suffering handled poorly. We don't usually take in a good horror story to see the protagonists succeed or do exceedingly well in their continuous battles against their antagonist. Yet we can take away similar lessons from it as we do with traditional story arcs. Aaron Morgenstern once wrote, Good and evil are a great deal more complex than a princess and a dragon. Is not the dragon the hero of his own story? Now, I no longer watch horror movies at a distance. I'm, I'm always waiting for the jump scares. I, I pine for the fear. I see past the imagery to look for the metaphors and symbolism, and I, and I hope desperately that the storytellers are able to effectively encapsulate one of the most beautiful tropes and stories, that feeling of being haunted. Everyone is haunted by something. In a similar way, I had to find a means to somehow enjoy the darker aspects of my psyche. It was needed for sur survival. <laughs> I had to appreciate them for what they are. After all, if there's no dragon to slay, how are we to expect our protagonist to turn into a hero at all? I elected to enjoy the inner workings of my mind as much as possible and, and work with them rather than curse them for existing. Just as monsters, ghosts, demons, murderers are crucial pieces to the development of a protagonist in a horror story, I believe that our own inner monsters function in precisely the same manner. There is a quotation which is often mistakenly applied to Abraham Lincoln, though there isn't a clear source for it. It says, We can complain because roses, bu rose bushes have thorns, or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. But the only reason that I have survived suicidal tendencies, or am able to handle corpses well, or find beauty in the macabre, isn't because I focus on the roses. It's because, in my own way, I celebrate the thorns. That's why the name of my podcast is what it is. Mania is one of the symptoms of bipolar. Instead of hiding it, it's always in full view. That leaves us to uncover my approach to storytelling itself, specifically with my podcast, and why I pursue the themes that I do. I do not claim to have found originality in my stories or ideas. However, like any miner searching for ore in a vein that has been largely tapped, I, I try to dig for what flecks of gold might remain. It is, so it's only natural to begin to search in places where one would think less people are inclined to look. Uh, the grotesque, the horrific, the terrifying, wicked, evil, and taboo. Um, this can often induce unpleasant imagery to those who aren't immediately fond of it. One might envision gory murders and graceless crimes, abhorrent depictions of death, torture. Um, in response, what I suggest is, before any horror, whether supernatural, human, plainly murderous, or grandly complex, there, there first exists a form of innocence. And where there is innocence, there is humanity, or at least the kind that we're we can stomach a little bit easier. Um, it is then just simply a matter of taking those two points of a monster or an antagonist journey and just placing them right next to each other. And then the juxtaposition can be made very naked. And in doing so, we can kind of observe not only a tragic descent, but a pitiable, maybe even understandable uh, progression or de-evolution from a kind of in innocence of which we are familiar into a realm of depraved intentions or sinister deeds. We do this not only to find a compelling story, but to, practice, but to practice compassion and empathy with extreme characters. During the October of 2018, I came up with this quotation. Every nightmare's soul contains a crying infant, each monster's heart a child helpless. 
It was shortly after writing this that the concept for mania was born. It made me wonder, much like witches in Salem, or the first anatomists who practiced on stolen corpses, just how many villains were misunderstood to the point of misguided hatred. Um, I started to ask questions. Like, do we take judgments on of other scapegoats in history for granted? Um, there are countless lesser forgotten antagonists in history. Is it perhaps that some of them are in part uh, or wholly victims? How many do we write off as devils before really knowing their whole story? And most importantly, must somebody be innocent for us to learn something valuable about ourselves, uh, to empathize with them, to find a mirror to our own actions? Mary Shelley sought to this conundrum with her book, The Modern Prometheus, or Frankenstein. It was it was one theme, at least. After all, Frankenstein's monster didn't ask to be born as a lonesome, ugly, violent, repugnant creature, nor did he ask to be abandoned by his creator, and refused love, strangled of conversation, pity, compassion, or even language. So should we feel malice towards Frankenstein's creation for lashing out at the world? Hardly. Doing so would be like feeling hatred for a snake which bites us when we when they th when they feel threatened. This begs the notion of um, determinism, the absence of, of free will, the lack of control there is in how our environment uh, shapes an individual. Frankenstein's monster is picture perfect for this, as are many serial killers in our world. That leaves us to wonder what traits of historical antagonists are based in justifiable criticism. In other words, just how much of a nightmare's worth is inspired by fact, and what indeed arises from fiction or our own assumptions. With this in hand, we can begin to sense the pluralistic concurrences between our own natures, our own natures and a monster's. The discrepancies between wrongdoings, blame, misunderstanding, fate, and misguided conviction. This I believe is where all the confusion is born, the, the misplaced hatred, and simultaneously it is where we have an opportunity to seek a, a more nuanced perspective by which to view what we call evil. Thankfully, many of us do not have, have it in us to be murderers, so we don't have to learn this from experience. Um, some struggle to consider a simple act of thievery even. You know, betrayal leaves a, a sour taste on the tongue. Infidelity, infidelity makes our, our stomachs squirm. But what we almost certainly share ubiquitously is the ability to fathom where such horrible actions might arise from, the innocuous thought which spirals into the previously inconceivable. Childhood trauma, pain, bitterness, disappointment in oneself, misplaced feelings of duty or obligations to family, tradition, peer pressure, a desperation to survive. Ultimately, what I am suggesting is that we share far more in common with our monsters or demons than we are led to believe. Our darkest propensities, after all, are only unthinkable until we have indulged them. Dr. Jekyll did not grow up hoping to become Mr. Hyde. It's just that one night, he was. What I dislike about cliche tellings of monsters, nightmares, and villains, of the, of the variety you might find in children's books or even young adult, book young adult books, is that they are portrayed as if they are not like us, you know, good people. They possess no inner quarrel, experience no doubt, soulful struggle or growth, indeed are not human at all. Instead, they're kind of hollow vessels, caricatures of what we might loathe. They're very uncomplicated, simply demented, or just plain wrong. And this is not a fault of the characters themselves. Um, I think this propensity for the portrayal of complex good and simplistic evil is some kind of cultural addiction. And I argue a more nearsighted perspective. Uh, villains in fiction are often too myopic. They commit terrible acts. They torment. They sneak into our dreams and turn our homes into hell. And we'll ask, well, why? Why did that character do that? And, well, that's just the way they were. It was often the response. We'd never, we'd never read a book with a normal protagonist expecting to find no method to their madness, no rhyme to their reason. There is a disparity between 
our complacency to understand protagonists and our craving to find common ground with antagonists. At the end of most stories, we see several threads neatly tied together, but who ties the antagonist's strings? Who finishes their final sentence? Where is their progression, their resolution? All the while, lurking behind the curtains and away from the spotlight, are secrets harbored by that other character, somebody we'd never choose to be a protagonist. Yet this individual grapples, matures, falls, and rises with just as much cause and reason as anyone, a person cradling a story, I argue, uh, far more intriguing than the ones we often hear about. All we need, I suspect, is a little more, a little more light, if I wish to make sense of them. This is a One of the questions I get asked the most, even from some of my closest family members, is if I'm bothered by constantly being surrounded by death. The gory imagery, nihilistic thoughts, and dark spirals which one would imagine might arise from it. Um, the truth is that death makes masterpieces of us all. We all become her little statues. Um, whenever I walk into a room with a body, I don't feel like I'm meeting the remains of a person. And that might sound horrible. I feel like I'm looking at another manifestation of death. Just another mask of hers. One of her artistic caricatures of the individual left behind. Uh, of course, coming to that realization was incredibly difficult at first. But after a while... Not only did the physical meetings with her become easier, but they started to feel more comfortable. Just as I grew a taste for horror stories, the, the shaking, adrenaline-induced stress I would get when um, first handling a corpse started to go away, and even in a strange way, I, I started to begin to enjoy it. Um, but there was something more to it that I never expected. The work began to empower me long after I would leave a shift and be home, and it's been quite prominent in everyday life. I think one of the quickest ways to appreciate life is to go through something horrible and come out of it feeling not weakened by our trauma or victimized, but strengthened by the opportunity to overcome it. And since so much of life is surrounded by mortality, the pressure of success at a young age and to make use of one's time, getting used to confronting corpses just felt like practicing being comfortable under the thumb of mortality and not just getting good at ignoring it or pushing the thought away, but I mean really feeling the pressure and really being relaxed with it and being inspired by it instead. And I suppose that's what all of this has been about looking for passion in unfamiliar places because life is already full of beauty inspiration and stories as writers and artists we're always chasing that but of course life is chock full of tragedy despair and its own very real horrors all i am trying to do is make sense of the thorns. So thank you for joining me in this panel. But with the current pandemic going on, I actually am unfortunately not certain if I'm, if I'm going to be here after this recording ends to answer any questions or, or spend some time with whoever's listening right now. Um, as undertakers are sort of first responders, um, and the pandemic has seen an increase in uh, death rates. It's, shifts have been more demanding. I've been called in, and you can't imagine how busy and chaotic things are. So I may not be here, but there is a very real possibility that I will. So I'm tentatively leaving this recording with um, me saying, I hope I am here to answer your questions, and I look forward to seeing you in the next few minutes. Um, but if I'm not, I'm terribly sorry. And uh, I just thank you for listening to this.
If you are at all interested of connecting with me online further, you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Harlequin Grimm. If you'd like to listen to my podcast, you can find that on Twitter at Mania Podcast. It's on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, all of the major platforms, and it's constantly getting more stories out. So thanks again for listening, and I hope to see you soon.